Thank you. How's everybody doing? Um, so I have been tasked with giving away a Blu-ray disc for any of you who have apparatus to play these. And it is um, a remastered version of Colleen Smith's debut feature, Dry Long So, which is quite wonderful. And so I'm going to ask if anyone knows Colleen's sun sign. And if you do, you can have this disc. OK, because that's your sign, sure. <laughs> it's not an inside job, I promise. Here you go, <laughs> All right. So, welcome to the Daily John stage, Emily. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Emily has a film in the festival called Above and Below the Ground, which screens... On Saturday at 2 p.m. And do you know which theater? It's in the Perelman Theater. Oh, okay, Perelman is here, so that's the theater around the corner. So Perfect. please make sure to see that. Um, for fun, we'll just ask you some general questions and then I'll get into some about the film. Um, so my first question for you is what is bringing joy lately? Ooh, um, honestly, um, I think being back, uh, I, I just moved back to the U.S., to, to the Philadelphia area about a couple days ago. I, oh my goodness. <laughs> I know, it's wild. So I'm still dealing with the jet lag. Where did I'm, you come from? Um, I've been in Bangkok, Thailand for the past year. Okay. Um, I've been on sabbatical. Um, and so coming back here, I think one of the things I'm really enjoying is just um, the clean air. <laughs> I don't take it for granted because, mm -hmm. yeah, um, basically in, in Bangkok, the because of climate change and pollution, often we've had to stay inside um, sometimes when it gets bad. So I've been enjoying the clean air since coming back. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't think of Philly as having clean air, know, so that's right? just quite a lot. It's all relative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what are you watching right now? Ooh. Um, as a mom of a two-year-old, to be honest, I don't have a lot of time um, for, for films and whatnot, but um, I would say I, because of that, I do end up watching quite a bit more Sesame Street and Ms. Rachel than I would like. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Um, are there any things that are inspiring you that aren't films, like music or... Maybe it's your kid. Like, what, what are, where are you finding inspiration these days? Um, yeah, I think, um, I guess being the, you know, being the daughter of an artist as well, I, I asked my mom recently, I was like, ah, oh, damn, like, it's really hard to make art and be a parent. And so I asked her, I was like, does being a mom, like, does it help you make better art? <laughs> so I think that for her, you know, she kind of convinced me like, you know, it's tiring, but I think there are, are moments of inspiration that you can get from it. It can make you a better artist. So I'm trying to see a little bit of that. Now that my kid is a little bit older, I do see like the kind of um, sheer joy that my son gets out of just like picking up a leaf, honestly, and just really admiring that, I think it does give you a new lens of like, a lens of beauty that you might, you know, that you can forget. So I do appreciate that. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's talk about um, your film, Above and Below the Ground. What made you make it? How did you get to the story? And what was it like going into developing the project? So um, I, it's sort of been a long time in the making because um, I first moved out to the Thai Myanmar border about 15 years ago. And um, so kind of the roots of the film are the work that I was doing then as an organizer, as a campaigner, working in solidarity with the movement for indigenous rights and for democracy in, in Myanmar. And then um, basically about about six, seven years ago, it's kind of scary to say that's how long it's been to make the film, because it's my first feature. Um, and I was reconnecting with some of the environmental activists then, and um, what I found out about is this, um, you know, people in Myanmar, they know about this environmental movement. Um, often outside the country, they might not, but um, it's the first country-wide environmental movement, right? So bringing really diverse peoples together um, to stop this mega dam project, this Chinese built mega dam project. So people know about that, and, and I was familiar with it. But what I didn't know, and what kind of inspired me to 
want to make a film about it is that what sparked the local resistance and eventually the countrywide movement is this um, music video album made by this punk rock, um, indigenous punk rock band called Blast. And um, when I saw those music videos and I heard what happened behind the scenes, like how they collaborated with these activists and how this is what how local people ended up finding out that there was a dam going to be built. Um, for me, that was like, this is a story that needs to be told, um, not only because I love karaoke and I think <laughs> music, video, music videos making social change is like always an interesting thing, but that um, these local activists, this rock band, these um, indigenous women activists, their leadership hasn't been recognized. And it's the folks who are from the ethnic majority and who are from the former capital who have gotten credit for the successes they've had. Um, and so just wanting to show this different kind of story is really what motivated me to start the film. Oh, great. Um, is this the first film you've made about the region? You said you have been there for, I don't know how long, but over 15 years ago, have you made other work? about the area? I have made other short films related um, to Myanmar. One was about women performance artists and how they were, you know, as democratic reforms were unfolding in the country, how they brought their performance art into the streets um, and the ways that audiences react to women taking up space in public. Um, so that was one film. It was a, an installation um, that I co-directed with Mia Sarah Lai and Mary Angela Mihai and another short film was um, actually mostly shot in the U.S., but focused on um, refugee women from Burma, Myanmar, who resettled to the United States. Mm -hmm. In Philly, by chance? I know we have a large no. community. But. Yes, there mm -hmm. is a, a pretty amazing diaspora community here in Philly, but this was when I was living in upstate New York. Okay, thank you. Um, how did you go about the work of building trust with the activists and what was it like having that level of access? How did you, you know, navigate that? I think that um, for, um, like I was mentioning before, um, my sort of background working in solidarity with the movements um, is kind of what laid the foundation of that trust. But I also think that, um, you know, just over years of time, right, like being there, spending time with the women activists in the rock band, I will say, like, it was a little bit harder with the rock band because they're also, you know, they're pastors and they just, they have a whole other vibe. Wait, a punk rock <laughs> band that are pastors? Yeah. Oh, I so, love this. <laughs> yeah, actually, churches are where um, a lot of the kitchen community um, get their musical education. So it, it makes sense within that context that they're also pastors, but you know, they don't drink and they don't, you know what I mean? They're just sort of like, I don't know, I've always found it easier to make films with women. Mm. So <laughs> getting closer to them and gaining their trust, I think was a different story. Um, but with the women activists, I think that um, it was kind of easy to build that relationship and over time and one, um, my, one moment that really kind of like, struck me in terms of, wow, this is like the level of trust and access is my producer said that, um, uh, John Ang Sen, she said that Lura, one of the women activists, um, told her like, if I die, um, tell my daughter or tell my kids um, to go to Emily because she has, like she knows my life story, like she mm -hmm. has everything. And I think that, um, I think a lot of filmmakers are in that position, right? But I think just to hear that made me feel like, okay, wow, this is a big responsibility, right? A big kind of sense of accountability that I have, um, that I have all of this footage, right? And so not only do I need to finish the film because they've been waiting for it, but just what does that mean in terms of the fact that, um, you know, as an Asian American um, filmmaker that's not from Myanmar and who is not um, indigenous kitchen from the community. I think thinking about what are the different levels of accountability and um, you know who at the end of the day I can take risks but those consequences will be different for the people who are in the film obviously. So that's always a question that I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, what are you hoping that people will get out of this film and from seeing the story? 
for me um, and for the whole team, um, our film uh, really has kind of two driving factors. Like one is we want to contribute to a, a change in narrative, and the other one is focused on movement building. Can you say more when you say a change in narrative? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm very distracted by your shoes because they're <laughs> gorgeous. <Thank you. laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, in terms of narrative shift, I think one of the things, and our film is not necessarily the only one who's trying to do this, but we see ourselves as kind of like a part of a broader wave of films who are trying to shift the narrative around environmental documentaries shot in Asia because a lot of the films, especially the kind of award-winning films that have come out, like Seaspiracy, The Cove, I don't know if you've seen any of those, but they really are like... Asian people in those films are either victims or villains, right? They're either like hunting the whales or they're being trafficked. And the heroes of the story are these white male environmental activists who are seeking to, right? Save. Saviors. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, the reality of the context is like, there's so many incredible environmental defenders, right? And so with this film, we really wanted to show you know, who are the true heroes? Like, who are the folks who are on the ground doing the organizing when it's not sexy, right? And sustaining that work behind a movement, a long-term movement. So we really wanted to highlight, especially the indigenous women activists, but also the rock band and what it is that they're doing. Um, and then in terms of mov movement building, like our film, um, the activists in the film, they represent two organizations. One is um, their land rights defenders, and the other is an environmental group. And we really see this film as an opportunity to build intersectional alliances because we don't want to only have um, think about environmental issues, but we also want to see how they intersect with indigenous sovereignty as well as like women's leadership. So we're hoping that the film can be a tool to bring these different groups together. Thank you. Um, you're the co-founder of two collectives, Ethnocene and the Riza Collective, or Riza? Ethnocene and Riza. Ethnocene yeah. and Riza, okay. Um, how did you get, how did you come to start these collectives and can you tell us a little bit about what they both do? Sure. Um, so, um, Riza Collective um, was started kind of amongst a group of friends who met on the Thai Myanmar border who wanted to bring together um, kind of an organizing and movement-based perspective together with healing and storytelling approaches. Um, and Ethnocene Collective um, was started by a group of um, anthropologists and filmmakers. And so they had different motivations, um, but I would say that what they have in common is just, and, and this is kind of how I think about collective organizing in general is like, there's only so much you can do alone, right? Making a film, and you know this as like someone who's like been such a trail trailblazer. There's so much, you know, you can push things only so much by yourself. You have to build a team and to really shift the conversation. And I feel like, you know, um, I don't know how you've done that. And I think it was just all me. There's no. <laughs> <time>. <laughs> just right. Exactly. Um, but I, I don't know how it is for you, but I feel like. For me, um, you're probably a lot more brave than I am, but I feel like sometimes it is scary to stand out there and do things on your own. But if you have other people, you know, you know someone's got your back. If you're, if you're doing something a little bit riskier, like you can show them a cut and say like, I know this is a little bit experimental, but like, do you think it's gonna fly, right? Like, so that kind of stuff. And so um, Ethnocene and Riza, I think, you know, especially an ethno scene, I will add that um, for us in the beginning, it was kind of a matter of survival because we were, you know, as, as women of color in anthropology and in documentary, we kind of felt like we were grappling with kind of the colonial baggage of those two disciplines and thinking that, okay, we need a space for ourselves to really create the work that we want and to not have to listen to all those voices so that's kind of how it started. But then moving forward, I think like slowly, slowly, we start building alliances with other folks who are organizing in the space, right? And doing this kind of work. And so um, I'm also a part of Asian American Documentary Network. Um, I'm on the um, 
steering committee is part of that, and I'm also a member of Brown Girl Stock Mafia. I think all of these collectives um, are playing a really critical role, like alongside all these cultural institutions like Black Star, right, who are really trying to challenge the broader industry. And how can we do that except build the spaces that we want and build a little piece of what it is we want to see and hope that that shifts things long term. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I, I know you're supposed to interview me, but I'm kind of curious what you think about, yeah, collective organizing and, like, what does it look like? What does it mean for you to think back on Black Star and how you've been able to build, like, you know, what now we kind of take for granted as the safe space for filmmakers of color who are making these, like, trailblazing films, but it probably didn't look like that in the beginning. <laughs> I mean, I, I honestly don't have an answer for you other than just like you said, like being intentional, you know, it's something that we're always thinking about. And so even now, just in the Slack, like there are issues that are coming up and we're collectively trying to figure them out as we go along. And that is how we approach the festival every year. We don't take it for granted either. You know, we are, there's no guarantee. And so it is just a constant thought of how can we make sure people feel safe? How can we make sure that the applications are accessible? You know what I mean? We're always sort of trying to play around with like, what is, should be the submissions cost or what should the windows look like? Like, how can we um, do more outreach so people should know that they can, you know what I mean? Like, we're always trying to think about what we may have missed or overlooked. And when we get feedback that feels constructive, um, you know, trying to incorporate that into how we plan. So, I mean, it's just, it's never, um, it's on, constantly iterating. Um, for, I think, a similar reason. Also, most of the staff are artists, mm -hmm. and I think some of us, um, or I should use an I statement, but I think it is many of us, this becomes our creative practice. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of creativity, I think, in a good way that goes into producing, you know, everything that we do, instead of making films. <laughs> If only we just did that. I know, but it's like, that's the thing. You have to do work on the institution as you're also trying to create the work. So, but, so you said you also, you're, you do a lot of the organizing on Slack? Um, during the festival. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. ADOC also organizes on Slack and it's, it's a love-hate with Slack. Yeah. I'm not a fan, but, <laughs> um, but I mean, it's, it's a convenient way to just be responsive and to make sure we're like putting out fires so that you don't find out about them. Hopefully. Um, I would love to ask you um, just one more question um, about, well, more than that. Can you talk a little bit about, because you're at Haverford, right? So are you um, an anthropologist or are you there as a filmmaker? Can you talk about, you know, sort of how those worlds have come together for you in your practice? Yeah, so um, I was hired to be um, in both the anthropology and the visual studies department. So I think there's... Um, more and more, I think folks are um, realizing within anthropology that there is a role for practitioners, people who are not only talking about the theory, but who are actually um, trying to, um, you know, that research, that filmmaking itself is a form of knowledge creation, right? And that process, it's not just how we trans, we're not just translating knowledge into a visual medium, but it's the artistic process that can create a different kind of knowledge. And so I think, um, so yeah, at Haverford, I teach, um, I teach some theory courses, um, on feminist ethnography. Um, I also teach some production courses um, like decolonizing visual anthropology. Um, that's, yeah, that where students get to, to make films as well. And I think we've been talking about this at ADOC, you know, Brown Girls Doc Mafia, all of the spaces for the last decade, but I think not everyone in the audience may know about it, and so I just love to have your perspective, given that you're coming from both of these fields, which are colonial fields, right? Like, they emerge with our contemporary colonialism and have so much baked in them that is not just and not with the best ethics, right? And I think that lots of us have been trying to infuse them with, you know, collective directing and um, how do we call people that we're, you know, who are participating in the films? Are they participants? Are they subjects? Are they collaborators? You know, thinking about all of those things. And I'm just curious for you, how has working both in, you know, filmmaking as a documentary maker or nonfiction maker and then doing this theory and then I'm sure confronting both of those, right? The supposed, you know, 
voice of God or, you know, even this idea of objectivity, which I don't believe exists, right? And I think there's so many brilliant filmmakers that have been like, F that, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna put myself in the center of this. I think about Dr. Yaba Blay in the audience as someone who centers herself in her work. And so what is, um, yeah, what has, how has it impacted both your scholarship and your making, thinking about all these issues? And also shout out to Color Congress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, sometimes it feels like a double burden in a way because um, of what you said, that there, there is the colonial history that's embedded in both. But I think what drew me to anthropology is um, this idea that non-Western wisdom and knowledge could um, be, be uh, important enough to be considered like knowledge and wisdom, right? Because, you know, some of the other departments, um, if you want to study um, Asian thought, it's, it's, that's considered the religion department. That's not actually philosophy. Philosophy is all the Europeans, right? And so for me, anthropology could be a space where, okay, that knowledge is taken seriously. Mm -hmm. That being said, there's so much work that has to be done and continually has to be done. So I think, um, you know, a lot of the work is through... Um, and through my colleagues and, and um, friends who are, and comrades who are doing um, work in Ethnocene Collective who are, you know, slowly trying to shift things. But we can't, you know, there's no like, we're always, I think it's only through the work that we do that we can kind of experiment and see. So um, for me, like the ethnographic process, um, it's really, working to shift how people think about that, right? Because similar to documentary, when sometimes when people think about anthropology and ethnography, they think, oh, you have to go to some exotic place and you have to film some people who have never been, you know, somehow touched by civilization. And that's such an old school way of thinking. And yes, there's a reason why we do think that way because there were anthropologists and docu documentary filmmakers who did do that work, right? That's, it comes from somewhere. But for me, the heart of ethnography ethnography and also in many ways um, verite filmmaking is right really um, a long-term relational kind of process where um, you, you you build kind of that accountability and you build knowledge and create you know the artistic process together so I think that there is a lot of potential for that and increasingly my students are um, not doing projects um, you know, they're doing projects on themselves, right? And they're doing projects on their families and their communities. And I think that's a, that's a shift that we're seeing in documentary. It's a shift that we're seeing in anthropology as well. Yeah. Um, I want to, I think we have about five minutes. Are there any questions in the audience? Yeah. Niall, oh, there you go. Sorry. <laughs> Not yet. Okay, awesome. Um, so I do have a comment, and it's basically, you know, just saying like Black Star, this event is just so eye opening because I didn't realize how closed minded I was just watching like American film and not really, you know, broadening my horizons with other writers or directors. And, you know, being able to hear from different people of color that may not be from America or have parents that aren't from America, it just. It helps me remember that it's not just for entertainment, it's really for us to learn about the world and how we should treat each other and understand each other. So, you know, just thank you for sharing your perspective and taking that chance on yourself because otherwise we don't know, you know, how other people operate. So this is just awesome and thank you, basically. <laughs> thank you. That's so sweet. Yeah. Um, and I think, like, for me, what you're sharing really just hones in on, like, I don't know how long this has been the tagline, but, like, film by and for the global majority. Oh, that was Imran, and that's brand new. It's indie oh. film by the global majority. This yeah. year is the first year. Okay, yeah. okay. I love that. Yeah. I love that so much because I feel like there have been um, efforts in the past to like build those bridges, right, between communities of color in the U.S. and, you know, the global south. But I think just thinking about what Black Star means for so many people is like a film festival that's not for the white gaze and that is by and for people who are the global majority. So I, like, I think to, to your point, I feel like, like for me, that's such a 
part of the beauty of Black Star. Thank you. Um, I think, is there a question right here? No? Oh, in the back. Hi, thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> I was just sitting back there but wanted to arrive because I didn't realize that you were um, presenting uh, or the director name to the film, but I'm really excited to see this um, as I do a lot of uh, international activism work with Anak Bayan. It's like a Philippine uh, national democratic org and I, we work with the Myanmar student union and so like I'm really excited to see this. One of the things, so my question is, is like one of the things when it comes to representing activism on film and like activist groups, it's like, I mean, I'll, I'll watch the film to see how it comes across in yours, but like uh, my biggest concern is just seeing like these groups represented and then it's like, oh, they've got it. They're taking care of it. I don't necessarily have to take action watching it. So I don't know if you have like reflections or thoughts on that, on how you've seen, um, I don't know, examples where uh, filmmakers really make it an open-ended question. Like, you know, you do have to walk away like learning from something from your comment um, just right before, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question, and I think that um, I can see that you know you're thinking from an activist perspective by by asking it that way. I I think in our film, what you'll see is I hope um, that we really want to ecologize the way that people think about movement leadership in general. Right? That there's way too many films that have like a hero figure or like that's that's not how movements work. Like. That's how it sometimes looks after the fact when you you know try to connect the dots. But in reality, there's so many people like behind the scenes who are playing different roles, et cetera. So I think even though it took a while, like I would say many years, because Lura, for example, our you know grandmother farmer protagonist, is like she always puts on a face of like complete and utter defiance. But in reality, there are these moments of fragility where she does show that you know, she can't keep carrying the weight of this movement. And so for us, a big part of what we want to show is the next generation of activists. And so that's why we have Khan Mai, who's the law student, um, who's also f displaced from by the dam. But through that mentorship relationship, I think we really want to show that, um, you know, one generation can't carry all of this alone and that we do constantly... Um, we need different roles. Every movement needs different roles, and that might include musicians and artists. It might include farmers, right? It might include law students. We need everyone. So I hope that that's what people will get out of the film. What a wonderful way to end. Thank you so much. Emily, can you remind us um, the name of the shorts block and the time of your screening again? Um, so this uh, Above and Below the Ground is going to be, it's a feature film. And so, it'll, so it'll, no, it's all good. It'll be, um, it'll be shown on Saturday at 2 p.m. Um, in the Paramount Theater right around here. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mary.